All right. Well, we are in week number five of Rhythms of the Soul, Rhythm of the Soul. Um, guys, as we've been going through the sermon series through the book of Psalms, we've been focusing on Psalms and what, what they bring to the daily rhythms or the continuous rhythms that we have in our lives. Or, so, so with that in mind, like, you know, last week we talked about how God speaks to us. He does. He speaks to us through his spirit, through his word. He wants to speak to us. He's constantly speaking. Are we listening? And today we're going to be in Psalm 51. Psalm 51 and we're going to talk about that God is the restorer, restorer of the brokenhearted. That he restores us when we're brokenhearted. That's what he does. That's one of, his, uh, one of his characteristics and what he likes to do. He likes to take broken pieces and put them back together. He's a great fixer. All right, so Psalm 51 is where we're going to be. So once you find it, I want you to take it, take that index finger and put it right here. And then I want you to turn to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 12, because that's where we're going to start. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 through 9 is where we're going to start, because Psalm 51, this is a little bit of background on Psalm 51. It was written by King David. Uh, David uh, was a mighty man of God. He was a guy who was a great warrior. He wrote most of the Psalms. He was known as a man after God's own heart. But David wasn't perfect. He might have been used by God to slay Goliath and, and to do amazing things, but he wasn't a perfect guy. In fact, he fell short, and in this way, he fell short big time. Psalm 51 is a broken-hearted psalm. Psalm written by, written by someone who has a broken heart. He's been called out on a major shameful sin. And where we see this, the sin that David was called out on, we see it in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. So let me go ahead and read this to you. So the Lord sent Nathan to David. So real quick, Nathan is a prophet. And what had happened is David had killed a man. Now he didn't formally kill him. But what he did was he ended up having, he had an affair. He committed adultery with a woman by the name of Bathsheba. And when he found out that she was pregnant with his baby, she, he sent Uriah the Hittite, which was her husband, to the very front lines, through the heat of the battle, and told the general, make sure he's right in the middle of the battle. So of course he died. And after he died, he took Bathsheba to be his wife. And to raise the child as if it was his own. To hide what he did. To hide his sin. And maybe in some way David thought he got away with it. Well, then we have the prophet Nathan. And we have the beginning of Samuel chapter 12. And it says this. So the Lord sent Nathan to David. When he arrived, he said to him, There were two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had, a, had very large flocks and herds. But the poor man had nothing except one small ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised her, and she grew up with him and with his children. And from his meager food she would eat, and from his cup she would drink. And in his arms she would sleep. She was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man. But the rich man could not bring himself to take one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for his guest. Now we have verse five here. So Nathan tells David this story. This is what David does. David was infuriated with this man and said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, that the man who did this deserves to die. Because he has done this thing and shown no pity, he must pay four lambs for that lamb. Nathan replied to David, you are the man. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. I anoint you king over Israel, and I rescued you from Saul. I gave you your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. And I gave you the house of Israel and all of Judah. And if that were not enough, I would have given you more. Why then have you despised the Lord's command by doing what I consider evil? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife as your own. You murdered him 
with the Amorite's sword. Now, later on, I'll say this real quick. Um, he goes on when he is, when he is at, the, at the very end of this. I want to say, yep, here you go. Verse 13 says this. David responded to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. He knows what he did was wrong. But that's the story. That's the buildup to Psalm 51. Here's King David, this mighty man of God, this mighty man of valor, the, the guy who leads David's mighty men, these, these basically supernatural superheroes led by God's spirit to do amazing things. He's the king of God's people. He's the one who writes psalms. He does all this great stuff. And he had gone from a shepherd boy by God's grace to become the king. And here he is. And what, and this, this encounter, a little bit of the background too is, Nathan isn't like in David's like room, bedroom telling him this. Or he's not like in his living room telling him this. He's in front of the court. So imagine if you think of a king, he's sitting on the throne. And judgment. Because as the king, he sits in judgment. So he's sitting on his throne, and here comes Nathan and goes, I gotta tell you this story, king. This is what happened. And David, in his kingly way, starts to pass judgment on this rich man who took the poor man's ewe lamb. And he does it in such a way that I bet the court was like, man, what a righteous judge. And right in the middle of all that, Nathan, the prophet of God, the one who's speaking, who God's speaking through him, looks at David and doesn't just say, hey, I just want to let you know you're the man. He yells it for all to hear. You are the man. And here's the judgment that's on you. Thus says the king of kings and lord of lords. So as we get into Psalm 51, I want to ask you this question. Have you ever been caught doing something shameful? Have you ever been caught doing something shameful? Now, there's so many things that could pop in your head from this, right? You know, when you think about being caught doing something shameful, some things that we are best not said in, in good company, especially on a Sunday morning. And some things you could think of now as, as an adult when you were maybe a kid was maybe small, but it was shame, shameful you in, for you in the moment. Or maybe it's something that, Maybe deep down when you hear this question, you've got something shameful in your heart and you're just hoping no one ever catches you or ever calls you out on it. When I think of being caught doing something shameful, I think of when I was a kid, I thought of myself as a storyteller. I love to tell stories. I was just, I would, man, I could just, I could tell a yarn, man. I could just get, I could just stretch this, this made up story and make this big, big deal out of a little, little thing. I was the kind of kid I was. I would go, I'd tell my mom and dad about, oh, I was fighting dragons and dinosaurs and all this stuff outside. And I was all doing all this, all this crazy stuff. And they'd just smile and go, okay. But I remember one time I was supposed to, um, I was supposed to do a chore for my mom. And instead of doing the chore, I made up a lie. I made up a story. But I had to make it realistic. I couldn't say like a dinosaur ate it. I had, to, I had to come up with a good story, so I just made up a story of why I could not do this, this chore. And I blamed, actually, my little brother, because that's what little brothers are for. You just pass the blame on. Well, if he didn't do this, I would have been able to do it, Mom, and I was dealing with him. And I remember saying it to my mom with absolute confidence, with a smile on my face, and having my mom He's a great mom. Look at me and know right away I was totally lying right to her face. Now, any parents in here, you've, you've had that moment when your blessed little child looks at you right in the eye and lies right to your face. It's kind of one of those moments. It's a, it's a, you have a couple different feelings, right? You have a feeling of that little snot. You know, you have that feeling, right? And then you have the feeling of, just brokenhearted, like, look at this, this kid you love so much, look at you right in the eye and just totally ready to tell you whatever you want to hear so that they don't have to deal with re the repercussions of what they've done. I remember my mom looking at me and going, I know for a fact that you're lying to me, Blake Andrew. That's my middle name, by the way. 
Whenever you hear the middle name, you know you're in trouble, right? I know for a fact you're lying to me, Blake Andrew, because your little brother was with me. And I know for a fact where you were and what was happening. I can't believe you would look me in the eye and lie to me. I remember that. Oh, my goodness. I was caught. I felt so ashamed. I felt like a dagger to the heart. I was, I'm so sorry, Mom. I remember those moments. And I'm going to be honest. There's a lot of other things I've been caught that was shameful, that was horrible, that were bad. That's the one I just felt comfortable sharing with you guys in public, being recorded, going on the internet. But if we're being really honest, if it was totally transparent in the room, some of the stories that would be brought up would break some of our hearts. We would break our hearts to tell them. Most likely, you've been caught doing something shameful. And feeling ashamed is a horrible feeling. Feeling not up to the character that God has created you to have or you've been trained to have by your parents or even that you felt the the standard you set for yourself. Seeing your neighbors and your friends see you in shame. It's horrible. There's nothing, there's very few things that could be as dreadful and as horrible as that. And that was David. He's the king on the throne in judgment called out in his shame. His secret shame that he tried to hide so, so terribly hot hid to the point of killing a man to take his wife, is now put out in front. But D- David does something really interesting. And this is where, if I was, if, if was going to say David had a superpower, like he had something he did that was just amazing that we can see and see that God gave him this heart. And this is a heart that if we have, we can just, and we're going to talk about that, that just in a second, if we can have the heart of repentance that David had, it's tremendous. I really believe that's what made him a man after God's own heart, was he was a man of repentance. And you've probably have heard that word before. It's a very churchy word. It's a word that us preachers like to say, repent. And we like to do all those kind of things, right? Repentance is actually an amazing, graceful word. It's a word that humbles us, yet frees us. And David understood this. So when he's caught in his shame, we see Psalm 51. So I, I give enough time. You're, you should have pulled back your index finger. Now you're in Psalm 51. Let's go ahead and read ver- verses one through five real quick. Verse one starts with this. Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love. According to your abundant compassion, blot out my rebellion. Completely wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. For I am conscious of my rebellion. My sin is always before me. Against you and you alone, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Indeed, I was guilty. When I was born, I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Point number one from Psalm 51 that we have here today And God is our, this restorer of the brokenness. We got to start with brass tacks. And that is this. Number one, sin is serious. Sin is serious. We see that David doesn't just come half-hearted to this, this psalm of repentance, this psalm of restoration. He comes with a broken heart. He lays it all out on the table. He starts out with, please. It's almost like a, I, 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 in the original language, it almost starts like this. Please be gracious to me, God. Be gracious according to your faithful love. This is who you are. This is your character. According to your abundant compassion, blot out my rebellion. Please take away my sin. Wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. Wash me. Make me clean. I feel dirty. When we sin sometimes or we're caught in sin, we feel dirty, right? feel gross. You guys ever had those moments? Like, ugh, I just feel like if I took a shower, it still wouldn't get rid of it. It's wash me. I'm conscious of this rebellion. I'm conscious that I've, my sin is always before me. He sees the repercussions of what he's done and the repercussions of the, the life he's living. 
against you. But this is what's crazy, guys. Sin is serious, not only for how we feel, not only for what we see, not only for the repercussions in our lives, not only because when we break the law, we have to pay a price, not only because when we hurt a feeling, we've got to ask for forgiveness, not only because when we, when we uh, perpetrate a sin on somebody, that somebody is, is, is entitled and we should give them forgiveness, or we should ask for forgiveness from them. Like, not only is it a personal life thing, but then we get to this moment, which I think we forget from time to time. And if you don't, good for you, but I do. And that's this. Verse 4. I think it breaks my heart to read it, because I forget this from time to time. Against you, you alone, I have sinned and done evil in your sight. Against you and you alone. So hold on a second. What about the evil, the, the sin he did to Bathsheba? Now we could talk about the, it takes two to tango in that kind of a situation, but here's the deal. She's doing what she's doing, and he's the king, and he called her into his chamber. What about what he did to Bathsheba? What about what he did to Uriah the Hittite? Uriah the Hittite got killed. What about what he did to the people of Israel? What about what he did to his family? The repercussions of this in his life for his family is that his family's in rebellion against him. The rest of David's story is not a good story. But him and Bathsheba's uh, child dies. His son Absalom tries to raise up an army and, and takes away the kingdom for a time being. David goes on the run. And constantly he's burying children who are fighting against each other. But yet in this moment, David understands that the paramount person that he has hurt with his sin, and this is why sin is so serious, it's not just repercussions in our lives, it's because we hurt God. Our sin is not a sin just against others and just against ourselves, it's a sin against the creator of the universe. We hurt him. And what has he done to deserve our hurt? He's created us. He's knitted us in our mother's womb. He has given us the gift of life. And then, if that were not enough, he gives us Christ. So that we can know him personally, so that we can be forgiven, that we can be washed clean, that this sin that is so serious can be dealt with. David understood that he sinned against God. He also understood that he had a sinful nature, that this was secondhand to him, and it's secondhand to us. He says this in verse 5, Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. He goes, listen, I, I was born with this angst to hurt you, God, to hurt others, to hurt myself. Whenever I, I meet someone who says, like, well, I was born this way. This is, this is the, the life I live because this is my wiring, my... Yes, we are born into a broken world, knitted in a broken world, put, us, put together in a broken world to the fact that when we are born into this world, we're born with a need for a Savior. We're born in need of redemption and reconciliation. We're born in need of restoration, we're already born as a broken pot, leaky, unable to be used. Yet, praise be to God that when we come to that understanding of how sin is so serious and we come to him and he restores us and renews us and, and like a potter with a broken warp piece of clay, he breaks us down and builds us into the vessel, the person, the creation that we were created to be. And he knows it because he knows us so intimately. Yet he knows that as he sends us into this world, he's sending us to be born into a world where we are born broken, living in a broken world with broken people doing broken things. Because sin is serious. It's perpetrated on God, on others, on ourselves. Our world is full of it. We call, we call things that God would say is bad and sinful, good, and honorable, and courageous, and worthy of, of being a foundation of our culture and a foundation of our lives. And we forget 
the repercussion of this, not only on our lives, but on how this breaks God's heart. Sin is serious. Your sin is serious. My sin is serious. Our sins are serious. In fact, if you ever wonder if your sin is, is serious or not, how serious is it that it is, is that God, if that was the only sin, the only sin, that little white lie I told my mama way back in the day, that's the only sin. I'm the only person to ever do that in all history. God so loved me and he so wanted to blot out that sin that he would send Jesus to die for this, that little white lie. Why? Because God is perfect. His son is perfect. And he wants to transform us and he wants you to know his perfect love. Agape love, this beyond love that we see in the New Testament. This word that we hear proclaimed so much, agape. I want to know God's agape love. This amazing, un, un, uh, unknowable love only comes through knowledge by way of forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Where we taste agape love and God's true love is when we know our sin is serious, we humble ourselves, hand it to him, and he forgives us, even though we don't deserve it. He makes a way where there is no way. David understood this. So he starts this out. He knows his sin is serious. He knows who he sinned against. And he knows also number two, and that is this, that God is gracious. God is gracious. Verse six through nine says this, surely you desire integrity in the inner self and you teach me wisdom deep within. Purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Turn, away, turn your face away from my sins and blot out all my guilt. Here's a crushed man. In fact, he says the weight of his sin, what he's done, has broken him to crush his bones. He feels that crushed. He goes, I know you desire for me to be transformed from the inside out. That's your hope, your desire, God. And you want to teach me this wisdom in this deep and profound way. But then he goes, please, Lord, please purify me. Wash me clean. Make me whiter than snow. Take away my sins. Let me hear joy and gladness. Even though I'm crushed, turn your face away from my sins and blot out my guilt. Take this away from me. David got a glimpse of something that we don't, that all humanity didn't get a glimpse of until Christ came. And that was grace. True grace. True presence of God. The Holy Spirit dwelling within you. David was one of those, by God's grace, one of those few people in the Old Testament that got a glimpse of this. The rest of it was done through tradition and through knowledge and through understanding that this is who God is and how he works. But David had a special relationship as the king of Israel, as God's anointed. And he understood this in this way, that God, even though God is great and God is, can be ter terrifying and, fear, and you should fear him in reverence and that he's big and he's the judge and that there is that happening, that he does do that because that's who he is. He's righteous. That he's also loving and gracious and he cares and he made a way and all these things that he understood that most people, if not anyone else of his age, would not understand. But we, through Jesus Christ, have a whole different understanding. The New Testament show us, shows us this as absolute truth is that our God is gracious, our God is caring, our God is for us, not against us, that he wants us, that he made a way where there was no way, that he just wants us to come to him. Come to me, all who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come and take on my yoke. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. God is gracious. God is loving. God is good. But God is also powerful. It's also perfect. So as we are crushed with the seriousness of our sin, God transforms us, cleans us, washes us, renews us, but he also transforms us. By his grace, not only does he forgive us and not only does he see us as clean and sees Christ in us, not only when you stand before God, he doesn't see you in all of your stuff, 
As Isaiah would say, our righteousness is like filthy rags before the Lord. He doesn't see us as people of filthy rags. He sees us as his sons and daughters through Jesus Christ. Not only do we have that, but then he does a couple cool things. We see here, he builds us up. He transforms our thinking. Our ways start to become his ways. The little white lies start to fly away and the truth comes out even when it hurts. Our pain turns into opportunity for us to grow. Many of people I've met that have gone through really hard seasons have come out on the other side going, you know what, in this really hard season, it was really hard. I never want to go through anything like that again. But you know, the person that started in that valley, being led by his shepherd, knowing that the shepherd has the rod and the staff to comfort them, the person that started in the valley is not the person who exited the valley. That person is transformed. Even in the hurt and the shame and the brokenness, that person was restored and that person is not the same. By God's grace, in hard times, we see transformation in our lives. That integrity, that thing within us, that wisdom that's deep within, it's taught to us in the valley. It can be taught to us on the mountaintop too, if we're listening, but sometimes it takes us being in utter darkness with nothing but God's staff comforting us. God's presence saying it's dark and lonely and broken, but I'll get you through. And in those moments, we're listening to the shepherd's voice. When the mountain tops and we've got the band playing and everything's good and there's this harps and beautiful and everything's awesome and we got no cares in the world, just, hey, you know, God is good, you know, too blessed to be stressed and you're doing all that stuff. Sometimes it's hard to hear the shepherd going, listen, there's something inside of you. There's, a, there's something serious inside of you you're holding on to. You're not addressing. You're not letting go. And it's corrupting. And it's, 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 it's pushing you down. It's crushing your bones. But you are too focused on the good to see the serious. The shepherd's voice gets drowned out by the cares of this world, the cares of our hearts, the desires we want, all the good we see. And next thing we know... We're back in the valley, feel like we're dropped from the mountain, that we stumble down and hit every little crevice on the way down, right? We're broken in this valley in utter darkness, hearing the shepherd's voice saying, I love you and I'm with you. Don't worry, I'll get you through this. God is gracious and good. God is amazing in that he meets us right where we're at. He loves us so desperately that he sent his son for us. And he loves us so wholeheartedly that he doesn't let us stay where we're at. He transforms us no matter what we're going through. God is gracious. He brings joy and gladness from things that were crushed. Broken hearts become the hearts of joy. Serious seasons become seasons, transform into seasons of gladness. I will never want to go through that when wish it on my enemy. But actually, and, and so crazy, is that now going through it, I'm thankful because I see God's hand. We wouldn't call, want to call it gladness because some of you guys have walked through seasons where you've had tremendous loss and you're not glad that person's gone or that thing has happened. But what you are glad about is that when you were crushed, God carried you through. His grace was more than sufficient enough for you. So that brings us to number three, and that is this. Humility plus repentance equals restoration. So I'm throwing a little bit of kind of a theological uh, equation your way, right? Right? A a Bible equation your way. Humility plus repentance equals restoration. So let's talk about that. Verses 10 through 19 says this. God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. 
Then I will teach your re- the rebellious your ways. The sinners will return to you. Save me from the guilt of, the, of bloodshed, God, God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not want a sacrifice or I would give it. You are not pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to you is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humbled heart, God. And your good pleasure cause Zion to prosper. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings, and the bulls will be offered on your altar. Humility plus repentance equals restoration. So let's talk about what's humility. What's humility? We see in verse 17 here. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humbled heart, God. In verse 16, it's, this is such a, an amazing passage because actually it kind of shows a dichotomy between the two kind of first main kings of Israel. The first king of Israel is a guy by the name of Saul. You may have heard of him, may not have heard of him. Until I went to Bible college, I had no idea who Saul was. All right, Saul was the first king of Israel, anointed by Samuel to go and to be this, this king that the people were clamoring for. Now, Saul was like any good political candidate. He was tall, good-looking, came, came from a tribe that had influence, all that kind of stuff. He was like the perfect candidate. The guy you see on the, with, uh, that doesn't really have to use the teleprompter that much, right? They just, he's just on it. He's the best and brightest of Israel. But yet Saul, even though Saul did some good things, he did some really horrible things. And the really horrible things were he did not walk in obedience to God. God told him to do something. He did what he wanted to do instead. His pride got in the way. This self-assurance and self-reliance got in the way. And when he thought that he had sinned against God, instead of coming humbly before God, what he did was he just gave an offering. He just went and did a burnt offering. If you don't know what that is, it's when they take an, take an animal and, and you, you kill it and you burn it. And that was like, their blood washes your blood clean. That's what people had to do before Christ, all right? Thank God that we have the Lamb of God who washes us clean. We don't have to go get old Bertha out of the barn and, and put her on an altar. I, I sinned today. That guy cut me off, and I said that thing and did that thing, you know? Uh, now we got to get old Bertha out. Poor Bertha. You know, she was this close to the cow retirement. All right, sorry. I got goofy right there. Um, Anyway, so we don't have to pull Bertha out of the barn anymore. We have Jesus. So here's the idea. He just pulled Bertha's out of the barn. He was just like, slaughter all the Bertha's we can find. Get all, the, get all the animals out there. We'll make God happy through this sacrifice. And Samuel tells him that's not what God's looking for. Now here's David, total opposite. David sees he's done this horrible thing. is so serious. And his reaction is, you don't want me to go get all the Berthas out of the barn and, and put them on the altar. What you want for me is to get them on, on my knees. In all humility, to hand us over to you, God, and to know that a humble and broken heart is really what you're looking for. You're not looking for Bertha. You're looking for my heart. You're looking for me to address and put my pride to the side and to say, listen, I'm broken. My bones are crushed. I've hurt you, God. I've hurt others. I've broken myself. Help me. Humility reminds us of our place truly in the flesh before God. Sometimes as Christians, we forget that we're his creation. We talk so much about him as our savior and how we love him so much and how we have a relationship with him and we need to know that relationship, which is good and awesome and true, but we forget he's also Lord. He's also God. He's also untamed, that he put the stars in the sky. I love how Job, at the end of Job, we all talk about having the patience of Job. Listen, the patience of Job is shown at the very end of that book. He comes not humbly before God, but in pride. And he gives it to God. You've hurt me, God. You've taken this. I've done all this good stuff. I'm I'm the good guy, God. And I love God's response to Job 
isn't, oh yeah, you're right, you're a good guy, and I'm so sorry that this happened to you. He didn't do that. No, he goes, hey, bud, where were you when I put the stars in the sky? Where were you when I created all things out of nothing? Who were you? Who do you think you are? In that moment, Job forgot who he was. In this moment, David knows who he is. It's by God's grace that he has his presence. It's by God's grace that he knows his love. It's by God's grace that he has this relationship. It's by God's merciful, loving, amazing grace. And in that moment, he comes humbly before me. He says, listen, help me, help me, help me. I'm crushed. Job didn't get that. What he did was he said, I'm good. And God, why would this happen? And God says, listen, if you try to tell me that I'm not good... You weren't there when I put the stars in the sky. You weren't there when I created all things. You are not me. I am the creator of good. I'm the creator of all things that are perfect. And you and I and definitely Job and definitely David, we're not perfect under our own power, by our own means. There's only one human being who's walked this earth and he was fully human, but he was also fully God that was absolutely perfect and that's Jesus Christ. Even Jesus showed humility to God. He was baptized when he shouldn't have been baptized. He's he's Jesus. He should have been the baptizer. John even says, he goes, I should be baptizing. You should be baptizing me. I shouldn't be baptizing you. He goes, we're doing this for righteousness sake. Such an amazing way of putting it. Jesus goes, listen, I'm not too big to know that I need to be right that I need to do what the Father tells me to do. If I'm going to ask you to do what the Father tells you to do, I'm going to do it too. I will show by example how to do this. In all humility, he kept going continuously before the Father. If you ever read the Gospel of Mark, by the way, this is a little bit of a nugget. You can write this in your notes. You got a little note section in your service handout if you didn't know that. In your little note section, I want you to write the Gospel of John equals the Gospel of Retreat. Before Jesus does anything really cool in the gospel of, oh, not John, Mark, I'm sorry. The gospel of Mark is the gospel of retreat. Before God does anything really, before Jesus does anything really cool in the gospel of Mark, he runs away. He goes up a mountain, he goes in a boat, and he talks to his father. He goes humbly before the father and he says, I need to connect with you. I need my marching orders and I'll go do it. Jesus is humble. David here is showing humility. When we show humility, when we understand that what God is looking for is us to come before him in honest, open, and just say, this is where we're at, and he will do something tremendous. And that brings us to repentance. Repentance is a big word that basically means this. It means coming humbly before God, asking for God to forgive you for whatever sin it is, Or maybe for your sins, plural. Forgive me for my sins. And then, it doesn't stop there, by the way. Then it's a turning away from that lifestyle. Repentance basically means to turn away. To turn away. Hey, God, I come humbly before you and I've been lying to this family member. So, Father, forgive me and I'm gonna go tell them the truth. Father, I come before you and I ask you to take away this need for alcohol in my life. I ask you to forgive me, restore me, transform me, and I don't want to live that way anymore, so help me to get in whatever program, to have the right people, and by your spirit to not live that way. Repentance is more than just asking for forgiveness. It's a willingness to change. So humility, I'm broken, I'm crushed, And then the willingness to change, I want to turn from this and ask for forgiveness, brings what? Brings restoration. It says this in verse 12. Restore the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. When we come before the Lord in all humility, willing to change, he restores us, reminds us of the joy of our salvation or gives us the joy of our salvation for the first time. 
for doing that for the first time, then he sustains you because you're willing to be sustained by him. You don't step back out in pride. I'm gonna do this on my own. I got this figured out. I pulled up my bootstraps. I, I could do all this. I just need to read more and pray more and do more. No, 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 no. I'm willing to continuously come back before the cross and let him transform me and renew me and give me a spirit, a humble heart. I love this too. This clean heart, the steadfast spirit, this is what God gives us. And I love how David here, he, he, he says this in verse 11. This always breaks my heart whenever I read this, by the way. You want to know David's heart here is verse 11. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from here. Now, understand this. When we talk about humility, David understood that this was all by God's grace. And he understood that in this moment, he did not deserve to ever, ever, ever feel God's presence again. He didn't deserve that. He didn't deserve God's presence. And he says, please. Oh, it's almost like a kid. Please. Please, God, don't banish me. Don't kick me out. Don't, don't kick me out of the house. Don't tell me to get lost. Don't tell me to never come back. Don't, don't do that, God. Don't take me from your presence. And please don't take your spirit from me. Don't take your presence, your, who, who you are and what you're doing, the character that I see, how you speak to me, how you renew me, all the psalms that I write. Don't take that from me. Here's the deal, guys. When we come before the Lord in humility with repentance, he restores us and he reminds us of who we are and what that means. And what that means is we are forgiven people, bought with a price. The price is the blood of Jesus Christ, his broken body for us. His broken body brings healing. His blood washes us clean like hyssop. It washes us clean. We're white as snow now. But here's what's so great. It's not because we did it. It's because he did it. That's what he does. And now we get to walk as people of forgiveness, people of repentance, people restored by Jesus Christ. And as we walk in that restoration, this is what happens. This is the outcome. We walk in that restoration. We see what David does here. He says, I will teach the rebellious your ways. The sinners will return to you. He goes, I will tell others who are broken and who are walking in pride. Hey, if you're broken and you're walking in pride, come before Jesus and he will forgive you. He will wash you clean. He will help you. Don't be in rebellion against him anymore. Don't be in rebellion against God. Return to him. Come to him. He loves you. He's calling you back. Verse 18 and 19 are kind of interesting at the very end of this psalm, but it makes perfect sense. He's the king. He knows that everything comes from the top down. He's in wrong, a wrong place with God. He goes, so if he's in the wrong place, then the people of Israel are going to be in the wrong place with God. So he comes back. He says, don't just renew me. Don't just restore me. But help me to teach others. But not only that, but in your good pleasure, cause Zion, the people of Israel, to prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Keep us safe. Don't judge the people because of my sin. Then you will delight in the righteous sacrifices. Then we can worship you. That's what this is. So there's a, there's a text where Jesus tells us that if we have a sin against a brother or sister, we should lay our sacrifice down and go take care of that first and then come back and worship. Here's what David is saying. He's saying, listen, we need to get right before God and then we can worship him. Then we can have a sacrifice. Then we can get Bertha out of the barn. Then we could do all that. Then we could go and put up a hymn of praise. Then we, could, then we could go and we can just give God glory for our lives because he's right in the middle of it. Guys, I'm telling you right now, if this is you today, if you're sitting here and you're going, oh, I'm being honest, I haven't really come before God and, and laid this thing at his feet. I've been walking in my own self-reliance, my own self-preservation. I've been listening to others and what they think is okay. You know, if you really are doing something and you know it's not right, you, the Bible's telling you it's not right, you, all you have to do is Google enough and you'll find someone who tells you it's okay. You, all you have to do is ask enough people in your life and someone will tell you, that's fine, don't worry about it. And you'll find some people who are even Christians or pastors who'll tell you it's okay. Listen, at the end of the day, it's not about what others are saying are okay in your life, it's about what God says is okay. He's the Lord. He's the final authority. So the big idea is this, guys. 
when we come to God with a broken heart over the sin in our life, ready to change, he will graciously forgive us and restore us. That's the big idea. If there's something you could take away from this, it's that. When we come before God with a broken heart over the sin in our life and we're ready to change, he will graciously forgive us and restore us. This is what he does. That's how he loves. You don't have to hide it from him. You know what's so funny? We think we hide stuff from God. You know, Adam and Eve thought that too. They thought they could just hide from God. Here's the deal. Whatever you've done, whatever has been done to you, whatever has happened, he's already, he already knows. He knows all things. He knows the end from the beginning, the beginning from the end. And he's ready, willing, and able to transform you, to help you, to lavish you with his love and forgiveness and to restore you. And what we see here with David, even though his family gets into shambles and even though his life isn't that great after this, he still has God. He still has that presence. At the end of his life, he's still going, praise be to God, he's still a worshiper. And no matter what happens in our lives, whatever happens in this world, we know that when we come humbly before our creator, ready to change, he will graciously not just forgive us and restore us, but he graciously never leaves us or forsakes us. You can't run from his love any longer. So what are some next steps that we can have here from this text? Number one, come to the altar. Come to the altar. God is waiting for you to hand over your sin and shame and replace it with joy and restoration. That's what he's waiting for. I love how the book of Revelation talks about he stands at the door and knocks. We let him in, he'll come and commune with us or be in community with us. Here's the idea, he is ready. He's just waiting. Don't wait for a nation, Nathan to come and confront you. And By God's grace, I might be that Nathan for you right now. And I don't say that with like pride, I say that with all humility. This might be that wake up call for you to say, I'm coming to the altar. I'm handing it before God. Don't wait for a Nathan to confront you. Just give it to him. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. And the uh, throne of grace is always available to you. Number two, change your direction. When you come to the Lord to ask for forgiveness and repent of your sin, you are also making a decision to turn away from that sin. God is here to help you and has given you three things. He's given you his spirit, his word, and his church as conduits of that help. The way that help comes is he gives you his spirit to guide you and help you. He gives you his word to understand, to read things like Psalm 51, testimonies of men and women throughout history. And he's also given you the church of Jesus Christ, redemption church and the body of Christ generally, the church. So someone who's just as broken as you or have been there, done that, bought that t-shirt can tell you, you don't have to buy the t-shirt like I did. You don't have to go through what I went through. You can stop right now and you can be transformed. God loves you. He doesn't want you to continue down that road. He wants you to be changed. So change your direction. Number three, and finally, walk in forgiveness. You are forgiven and not forsaken by God. I want, I want to repeat that. Because sometimes when we think of this, we think of ourselves as, as man, like God, God just hates us. God doesn't want anything to do with us. No, 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 no. When we come before him, you are forgiven and not forsaken by God. Remind yourself of this fact. Remind yourself of this fact, especially when you struggle and continuously lean on God's guidance and grace. Don't try to do it on your own. It's just like if any one of you guys have, are in recovery, you're in a, like a program. You know, those programs, you've got people in your life that are there to sponsor you and to help you through it. But not only that, they tell you, don't get out of the program. Don't, don't go try to do this on your own. You've got these steps. You've got these ways. Well, it's just like that when it comes to our life. When we start to back away from God and we start to get disconnected and disengaged from the things of the church and from the things of God, next thing we know, we start to forget that we're forgiven and not forsaken. And this reminder helps us when we struggle and it helps us to rely on God. And let, let me tell you, if you're sitting here and your pride is telling you, I don't rely on anyone but myself, I'm telling you right now, take that to the altar because in absolute truth, you cannot do this. 
If you needed that fact, let me give it to you now. I don't care how cool you are. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how broad your shoulders are. I don't care how successful you are in this world. You can be a multi-billionaire, have it made in the shade, be smarter than everyone else, better looking than everyone else, have all the charisma that anyone can muster. You can be like, if I want to run for president, everyone will vote for me. You can be that person. And let me tell you right now, in all humility and all, and in your pride, you would think you could do this. I can do this. Well, guess what? You can't. You desperately can't. In fact, you are a prime example of someone set for fall. If you're in here today and you are like David and you say, I know I can't do this. I'm coming before in all humi- God in all humility. I'm asking him to change my life and I'm walking in his forgiveness and grace and I'm seeking his restoration. Well, guess what? You are much, much in a much better situation than the best looking, best dressed and brightest could be on their own. Because you've got Jesus. And if we're being honest, he is the best. He is perfect. And none of us, any of us, could ever hope to be just like him. So what happens is he transforms us into his image. Imagine that. That's how he does it. Guys, I could stand up here and talk more and more and more about his grace. More and more and more about how you're forgiven. More and more and more about how you haven't been forsaken. More and more about how in all humility we could come before the throne. That's not by our works, it's by him. But I can tell you right now, what you really need to do is talk to him. He's the miracle worker. So if you're in here today and you've got something, maybe that something is you've never really given your life to Jesus. Well, you can do it right now. Maybe that thing is, you've given your life to Jesus, but you're just kind of doing your own thing right here. Well, stop. Change your direction. Hand it to him. Let him transform you. Don't, let him, don't leave here without that. I want to pray with you if you're in any of those camps. And if you're in here today and you think, I'm good, I got this, like everything's good, I would pray as we pray, I pray that God examines you and helps you to see where you may need to hand something over to him. We think that's hard, but in all honesty, it's it's such a relief to receive his grace and mercy.